Hello and welcome to today's show which will handle the topics high pressure laminate and furniture or desktop linoleum. This will not be the typical how to laminate your router table to get a durable top. No, this will more be about combining solid wood with these materials to get a more fine woodworking look to it. Personally I think these materials has an undeserved bad reputation among us woodworkers. We associate it with like cheap countertops with plastic looks and so on. But when you start combining it with solid wood and make some features out of it, I think it has its place also in finer type of woodworking, especially when you're looking for really durable materials or just want to add bigger areas of color to a project. This will be divided into three parts. In the first part I will show some things I built combining laminate and solid wood. I will also have a basic material overview and then I will finish part one with a quick walk through how to achieve this look with big rounded corners and profiles together with laminate. In part two, which is divided into an A and B part, I will make a complete detailed build of this tabletop I did for a bathroom cabinet that I just completed. And for those of you who haven't worked with these materials before, I would say that this part two will be a very good walkthrough and how to, how to work with these materials where I cover every step. Then in part 3 it will be slightly more advanced where I focus on these integrated features in solid wood combined with these materials. These features could typically be drawer pulls or handles or handles or pulls for cabinet doors. So I will show some things I built using a combination of laminate and solid wood and I will start with the most simple ones, the plain tabletops. And then we work our way up from there in complexity. For those of you who watch my short tour movie, you know that in this corner my girlfriend sits drinking cognac sometimes and for that she needed a specially designed cognac cabinet and to that she needed a specially designed table as well so this is a typical example of a simple tabletop using high pressure laminate and solid wood for the edges in this case it's walnut this video is a bit dark and the purpose of this is to show you the top on this cabinet that we have standing under our TV. Here I use this super matte black laminate and the purpose of that is to minimize the reflections from the TV. Step up in complexity from those plain tabletops are these cabinet doors or drawer fronts with these integrated pull grips in solid wood. Next level I would say is when you build entire cabinet in laminate and solid edging like this bathroom cabinet here which has white laminate and adding in solid oak on all surfaces and it has some special features on the back side like these cutouts here they are for the drain from the sink those were all samples of a combination of laminate and solid wood although the wood features weren't that present maybe mainly the edges were in wood but I built some things as well where I really combined these materials this is a storage box I built a few of these for our kitchen and in this we typically store tomatoes or fruits or other small things. The entire outside is in solid wood and it's box jointed together while the internals inside the box are covered with laminate. And here I think these two materials really shines together. The internals in laminates are really easy to clean out using cleaning agents or whatever you like. While the outsides in solid wood with this joinery gives it the final woodworking appearance. A similar technique was used for this bathroom cabinet where the frame is in solid wood and then the shelves are covered with laminate. The technique for this maybe to be presented in a part 4 is that I first applied the laminate and then routed it away from the box joint area before cutting the box joints. I will now give you a brief material overview for the high pressure laminates and the linoleums and the pros and cons for each material. I have to say that I'm no expert on this area. It's like a big gray zone what is what, especially for the laminates. But hopefully I should give you a brief introduction and then if you want to know more you can read on the internet. We start with the high pressure laminates. These are typically used in applications like kitchen countertops and bathroom cabinets and floors and these kind of things where you need very high durability. Because it is very durable in terms of heat and water solvent cleaning agent and scratch resistance. The very basic principle for making a high pressure laminate is that you have 6 to 8 layers of craft paper impregnated with melamine or phenolic resin. On top of that you place a decorative layer and that could have both different patterns and textures and so on. 
And to finish this sandwich you have an overlay film that protects the decorative layer. Then you push this together under high pressure and temperature and then you have your high pressure laminate. They come in a variety of colors and patterns and textures and so on. Typical thickness is 0.7 millimeters, but I've seen 1.2 millimeters as well. What you see out here is a cheaper backer laminate, usually used for unseen surfaces of the product, like the backside of a tabletop. This is pretty much the same as the high pressure laminate, but you skip the decorative layer and the overlay protective film. At least in Sweden, where I live, you buy these high pressure laminates in rolls that are 1.3 meters wide and about 3 meters long. To touch the grey zone area and the word melamin. As I said before, melamine could be an ingredient in these high pressure laminates, but some people refer to melamin as its own material. And what they then mean is the melamine paper that is bonded directly onto the surface. This is a very thin layer and it's a low pressure laminate and it doesn't have the same durability at all as the high pressure ones. If we then switch over to the furniture linoleums, these are typically used for writing desks, tabletops, cabinet doors, drawer fronts and these kind of furniture things. It has a, has a natural soft touch to it and it's a very durable material, although maybe not as durable as the high pressure laminates, but here the linoleum has an advantage. These are delivered pre-finished and if it gets dull in a few years you can sand it down and put a new finish on it. This also comes in a variety of colors, although I haven't seen that many bright colors or textures or patterns as for the high pressure laminate. A typical thickness of a furniture linoleum is 2 millimeters. I buy this in width of 1.2 meters and then I decide how much I want from that width. Uh, so it's slightly more custom than the high pressure laminate that I needed to buy a complete roll. The furniture linoleums on the back side have a thick kind of paper carrier. Then the actual linoleum layer, I guess different supplier use different mixes, but what I read it's a mix of solidified linseed oil and pine resin and sawdust and some other nature materials. Price-wise the linoleum is slightly more expensive than the laminate, but not that much more expensive as it feels like. That may have sounded strange, I'll try to explain. This feels super exclusive and gives a nice natural touch and feel to your product and it feels like a high-end furniture. The laminate is very practical and very durable and I put it on some things myself but it doesn't give that really high-end feeling to, to your product. You work with these materials pretty much the same way. You glue them onto a stable carrier that could be plywood or MDF or any other sheet goods. Then you apply your visible laminate or linoleum on one side and on the back side you apply this backer material and it's really important that you laminate both sides of the product to prevent warping or other problems. I know the linoleum manufacturers they have some kind of paper for applying on the back side. I haven't tested that myself. I always use this cheaper kind of backer laminate also for linoleum parts. You apply the linoleum or the laminate using glue and the most popular ones that I know of is contact cement or normal white wood glue, PVA glue. It's not recommended to apply these materials to solid wood because then you don't let the wood move and the result can be warping or cupping or cracking. And with that in mind and what I just said about always laminating both surfaces of your product, how could I make these small storage boxes then? They break both these rules. It's only laminated on the inside and it's laminated onto solid wood. Well, to start with here the dimensions are really small and the wood movement in this width is almost zero. And the parts overall are very small and the corner joints are really strong. So if I have a small cupping or warping of this part in these small dimensions, I think these corner joints will hold it together. So where is the limit then? Well, I don't know, but if we go up to this width of wood, it's about 20 centimeters. I would never apply these kind of materials because the wood movement is just too big and you will get into problems. You can machine both these materials using normal woodworking tools. The high pressure laminate will wear your tools slightly and you will also encounter some chip out problems on the exit side, especially on the table saw. But my fix for that is to do all the dimensioning of the parts before I apply the laminate and then I just trim out it to fit my base material, but more about that later. 
I will now give a very quick workflow overview how to achieve this kind of look with laminate or linoleum and solid edging and big rounded corners and these internal features. And as I said, this will be very quick. I will go into detail on these subjects much more in part two and three. And to describe my workflow, I start with a comparison with a preveneered sheet. If you work with these preveneered sheets, you usually cut your sheet goods to size and then you expand it with solid edging that is slightly proud of the veneer. After gluing on the edge banding you trim it flush with a veneer and you can use a hand plane or a router or uh, sand it down to make it really flush and seamless to the veneer and it doesn't matter if you sand slightly into the veneer. Let's move over to our materials and we start with the laminate. Let's say that we use a similar approach as this ash veneered MDF. We have this laminated piece and then we cut that to size and then we glue on the solid edge banding and then we trim the edge banding flush with the laminate. Well, that's an extremely delicate operation. If you plane this or route this or sand this down flush with the laminate, once you go into the laminate with sandpaper or whatever, you get scratches and you have to scrap the part. So this is an approach that I don't use when working with laminate. Just a quick mention of the linoleums as well. Let's say that we use the same approach, we glue it onto carrier and cut that to size and then we glue on the edge banding and then we try to trim the edge banding flush with a linoleum. Here is actually a difference between the linoleums and the laminates. Linoleums you can sand down. Maybe after a few years if the finish is getting dull you sand the entire sheet and refinish it. But if you start your build with trimming this flush with this and using sandpapers and scratching the linoleum, that means you would need to resand the entire linoleum and put a new finish on it. And from my point of view, that's not a good way to start the build. This is delivered pre finished and I don't want to start with refinishing it. So I treat this pretty much as laminate from build perspective and I try to mess with it as little as possible. I know that there are some people and machines that do what I just recommended against and put on the edge banding after the laminate or linoleum but I think it's a high risk operation and this is not my preferred way of doing this. If you really are after this look where the laminate or linoleum is framed with a large wooden frame that is more or less flush with a, with a laminate I recommend you do the following. So instead of edge banding the laminated sheet and trying to make the surfaces flush I would have it as two separate parts where you frame the laminate with solid wood but still have it as two separate pieces. Watch carefully this could be the best magic you see today. So here is the laminated piece and that's framed with this wooden frame. This gives a few advantages if you prefer this look. Number one is you can treat this separately. You can sand this down and make it level and everything without scratching the laminate and if you need to refinish the wood in the future you can remove the laminate and just refinish the wood. If you prefer this look and use this technique I recommend that you put a small round or a chamfer on these inside edges of the wood that way you can recess the laminate slightly but you won't feel the edge that much. I will not mention this one anymore. There are many ways to make like a floating panel and that is not the topic of today. This is not my preferred way of working with these materials. So instead I will switch focus and stop talking about how I don't work with these materials and instead begin talking about how I do work with them. The way I work with these materials is to do as much woodworking as I can before I apply the laminate or the linoleum. So for a simple tabletop like this this is what my part looks like before I apply the laminate. So the edge bandings are glued on and trimmed flush with the base material on both sides. And then if I want extra features, those are also added to the part before I apply the laminate or the linoleum. So these ones here with these integrated grips, I've added a solid puck before I apply the laminate. And then after lamination, I bring out this grip using uh, router template. This elongated grip is done pretty much the same way. But let's head back to our simple part. These ones here I will show in detail in part 3 of this video series. Then I glue on the laminate or linoleum on both the visible side and the back side. And these sheets are cut slightly oversized. 
In the next step, I trim away this overhanging excess laminate so it now becomes flush with my auto surfaces of the part. And then I put the round on the corners. After making the corner rounds, I profile all the edges. And then, as a final step, I put some kind of finish to the wooden parts of the workpiece. And with that we have reached the end of part 1. In part 2 and 3, as I mentioned, I will build real things using these materials. and There will be more action and less talking, and I hopefully see you there. Thank you very much.